So classics is all around us. I mean, if you look, uh, the books we read are written in Latin letters. Uh, you know, like the alphabet, a Greek word, came from us. Uh, the institutions, democracy, which we inherit from the Greeks, are with us. So classics, in a way, is a wonderful subject uh, to study. Yes, and in fact, it's not only the fact that it is talking to us today and entering as that it has entered the wo our world today. It's also that th these texts are great texts in themselves. They tell us amazing stories. They use amazing literary techniques to express for themselves. For instance, there's Homer, the great story of the Trojan War, this conflict between East and West, uh, where you have uh, basically two uh, civilizations going against each other, clashing, clashing with each other over one girl, Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman in the world. That is a wonderful story. It's also very interesting because it is telling us about the rivalry within the Greek camp between two men, Achilles and Agamemnon, the competition they're undergoing, the feeling of loneliness that Achilles can uh, experience when he's let down by Agamemnon. So all these feelings, these emotions talk to us today and make the Iliad a great text to study in itself. And of course it uh, talks about this experience of war. There are battlefield scenes where people try uh, to win over, to survive. They see their comrades slaughtered. Uh, and then of course there's the loss of Patroclus. Uh, you know, Achilles loses uh, his uh, very good friend uh, and is enraged. So on many different levels, uh, the Iliad, Homer, still talks to us uh, today. Yes, and of course this is a Greek text, but on the Latin side, in Rome, you have other amazing texts. For instance, the, um, the Catiline, the speech against Catiline that were made written and pronounced by the great writer Cicero at a time when um, there were a, a political struggle, when someone was threatening the Roman mm. government to make a political coup. One man, Cicero, wrote these amazing speeches and through the use of languages and persuasion and rhetoric, he managed to convince the, the, the Roman people that Catiline was uh, uh, someone that was illegitimate, that could not... Yeah, and, and he saved the day, right? He, yes. He, he pronounces this speech, the first, and uh, Catalina runs out of the Senate uh, and uh, Cicero saves the day. And of course, uh, nowadays, this sort of rhetoric and oratory is still with us because we have somebody like Churchill, a great orator, a great uh, uh, speechwriter in his own right, who saved the day during the Second World War through persuasion, by rallying his troops, by rallying the population, and uh, making sure that Nazi Germany would not uh, conquer Britain. And he was a great admirer of Cicero. So this uh, oratory, this uh, tradition of speech writing is still with us today. But of course, uh, there's not only political speeches. There are also emotions and yes, feelings. So. Yes, of course. There is love poetry, for instance, that is extremely important in antiquity. And if you look in the Greek world, you have someone like Sappho, the first lesbian, a poetess who wrote this amazing poem to her, one of her pupils who was unfortunately in love with a man. And she talks about her longing, the paralysis she experienced, the physical uh, physical the fire effects. that runs through her. Yes, and this love, this un, un, unreciprocated love that she experienced. And of course these emotions, this poem is still talking to us. It's still talking about universal feelings and emotions. Of course, and then there's Catullus uh, who writes a Latin version of that particular poem. But also other uh, poets in Latin like Ovid and um, the Ballas and others who talk about their longing, who talk about their emotions uh, uh, in a way that talks to us. And sometimes, of course, they also use language which we cannot possibly repeat here to camera because of their sexual innuendos or their <laughs> very explicit nature. Indeed, Peter, that's very true. But surely the classical heritage is not only limited to the Western world. Of course not. I mean, sometimes we think we have this, uh, we look around us and classics is everywhere, wherever we look. Uh, and so our Western tradition is a tradition which comes from 
uh, you know, the classics. Now that's true, of course, but it's true also for another civilization, that of the Arabs and the Muslims, because not just in the West, but also in the East, uh, certain classical figures uh, were models. So there's uh, Plato, there's Aristotle, these two great philosophers who inspired generations of philosophers and thinkers in the Arab and in the Muslim world uh, from the ninth century onwards. There's Hippocrates, the great doctor, and Galen, another great doctor, who determine how medicine then develops in the Arab world, and that continues, and they have, they take part in the same discussions, and the, these same classics are the basis of their thought. Yes, and of course there is the Quran, this amazing text. Yes, I mean, if you look at the first uh, surah, the first chapter of the Quran, uh, what you see is that there's one word, one noun, which is repeated t twice. Sirat, it means path, the right path. Sirat al mustaqim And this word, sirat, actually is related to our word street. It comes from via starata, you know, like a paved way. The Romans were great at building, you know, roads, uh, amphitheaters and all that stuff, you know, like baths and uh, sanitation. And so some of these Latin words ended not only English, but also Arabic. And there in this seminal text, in the most important part of this seminal Muslim text, we have a Latin word, of course, an Arabic word derived from Latin. So this just symbolizes that uh, this culture is all pervasive. Yes, and it is, in, in fact, through the Arabic translations of many Greek texts of Plato, Aristotle, and the medical texts that, um, that antiquity enters the Western world in the Middle Ages, where there is a loss of memory of this cultural heritage. It's only through the Arabic scholars that they rediscover all these texts. And these texts, mostly by Aristotle, are extremely important at that time to um, give rise to one of the most important philosophical movements of the time, which is called scholasticism. In scholasticism, you hear the word school, which was a form of philosophy that was taught in the first universities. And that's extremely important. It's also a very important movement because it's a way for Christian people, Christian philosophers, to make a sort of harmony between Christianity and the Philosophy. world philosophy, mm. the world of antiquity. And the, one of the key figures here, of course, is Averroes, Ibn Rushd, uh, this 13th century Muslim physician who lives in uh, Muslim Spain, uh, you know, like is brought up in the Arabic tradition, reads Aristotle in Arabic, and he comments on Aristotelian works again and again, and he becomes the commentator, and then the Christian theologian Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest, if ever there was one, is very much in dialogue with, inspired by this Averroes, and talks to him. And you have also somebody, a, a Jewish thinker, the greatest Jewish thinker uh, ever, Maimonides, um, who, again, continues debates uh, about the nature of God, and uh, is within this tradition, you know, like uses Greek text in Arabic, uses Jewish thought, and then inspires also Christian thinkers. So you have this continuity, these three religions talking to each other conti continuously uh, during the Middle Ages, always on the basis of that classical tradition. Yes, and in the 14th and 15th century, when humanists, another type of philosophers in Italy, set up a new cultural and to some extent ideological agenda, against med medieval philosophy and scholasticism. It's again based on a cl the classical heritage that they set this agenda. They so rediscover they re new texts, Yeah, right? they uh, rediscover new texts, they translate them. The most important philosopher that they rediscover is, of course, Plato. Plato um, and they start to, to show that Plato was as good, if not better, than Aristotle. And this, of course, has resonance throughout in the, in the art, in politics, course, yeah. in ethics, in philosophy. And, and, and in lifestyle, you have like these little communities of uh, people who think they are like a new platonic academy and they like to drink, they have you know, the carousals, you know, like banquets, because uh, Plato famously wrote a banquet, the symposium. Yes, and of course, if you men since you mentioned the banquet, we can also talk about love poetry, which is extremely important, um, especially Again, in the Renaissance. Yes. And 
you, for example, when you see all these paintings, these beautiful sculptures that were made celebrating the beauty, it's not only if you see, for example, Titian representing this reclining, beautiful lady. It's not only an erotic piece or a pleasing to the eyes piece. It also has a whole philosophical background underlying it that people at the time definitely understood. So and because the good is the beautiful. Yes. So there's like this, uh, this link which we find in Plato and uh, which goes on. But of course art, we also have these great great stories, the myths, you know, like there's for instance the myth of Narcissus, uh, this man who's so much in love with himself that he looks inside uh, um, the, um, pond. the lake, uh, a pond, uh, and then drowns because of the, uh, the love to himself. And that continues in art, that continues uh, in literature again and again. So to come back uh, to our initial point, the classics are with us today. The classical texts talk to us again and again. They talk to generations and generations during the Middle Ages, in the East, in the West, during the Renaissance, during the early modern period, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, in the 21st century. We have films about the classics. We have all that stuff. Of course, this tradition lives with us. But on the other hand, this is a great tradition. This is an interesting tradition. And you can see that it is an interesting tradition because again and again and again, it talks to us and it talks to generations and generations of artists and writers.